Welcome to the Aggie Merge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to this episode of the Aggie Merge Podcast. You know, we get to visit with some amazing folks here. And in addition to that, we get to introduce you to technologies that are helping growers meet the challenges of building soil health. Today is no exception, as we welcome Paul Mikesell, founder and CEO of Carbon Robotics, where they have developed a system and technology for weed control that uses computer vision and very high-powered lasers as the action for weed eradication. Let's listen in as Paul talks about the opportunities this technology creates. Well, welcome to this episode of the Ag Emerge podcast. I'm very excited to have uh, Paul on the phone here today. Paul is the founder and CEO, and we're so excited to hear about this technology that he's got to share today. So I'm going to let him introduce his company, his vision, his why, and how he got started. So Paul, welcome. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'll tell you about Carbon Robotics. We uh, have developed a system and technology for weed control that uses computer vision and then very high-powered lasers as the action for weed eradication. Um, so this technology comes from, uh, we, we have some tech folks who've been working on a lot of computer vision technology coming from places like the self-driving car space and other kinds of uh, what's called deep learning uh, computer vision. And you know we use that technology for a bunch of different stuff, finding, um, building footprints from satellite images, that kind of thing. And so we wanted to apply this technology to something more real world, something actual uh, down and dirty in the, in the earth. Um, after spending a bunch of time working with farmers, we, we figured out that this weed control issue was something that we could do a lot better on. And as soon as we realized that the lasers were going to be effective, then we started building as fast as we could. And so the benefit to the lasers are from a, from a practical standpoint, they don't hit the earth, so they don't get knocked out of calibration. They don't hit rocks and things like that, which makes them over time just easier to service, easier to deal with. And the results are um, because we can kill these weeds so early in their life cycle before they really get going, before they've stolen very uh, much at all nutrients or or water from your uh, from your ground system, we kill them super early because the lasers are just very targeted. And so what that means is we can get in between your crops. Um, we can kill weeds. You, you may have seen some videos on our website that show this pretty clearly, but we can kill weeds in between very densely planted crops and do it very accurately. Um, in addition to not doing any cultivation for weed control, we don't tar tear up that soil. So it's a very regenerative process because we're not eroding that soil layer. So there's the water runoff is much reduced. Um, there's a lot more, better water absorption. We're not destroying that microbiome that's in the top couple layers of soil. Um, and so there's a lot of benefits to the way that we do it. Just generally not cultivating for weed control has solved a bunch of different problems in agriculture. I think that's a, that's a great point you make there, Paul, because when you said, you know, you don't, don't hit the earth and yeah. you look at a lot of the other uh, weeding technologies that have come out, they use, use optics and some sort mm -hmm. of a air drive or electric drive hoeing device, essentially. Yeah. And uh, that's a great point and, and allows you to be, um, does that also allow you to, if, you, if your beds aren't perfectly shaped in, in yeah. a type situation where you have more tolerances of, um, of that height control, sure. Wait, is that true on the laser? Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, we have we have some videos on our website of of um, weed control and very densely planted spinach. So it's it's planted so so densely you can't really even tell where the rows are, and we're able to get in, get in between there and uh, kill all the weeds in between all the plants. Additionally, if you're going to do something like move between different crops that have different spacing, it doesn't really matter to us because we can hit anything that the camera can see. 
So you can go from your onions to your carrots to your broccolis and not have to change your setup because the whole thing is done visually and then with this targeting system. So that's important because not everybody listening to podcasts here is a produce grower, but that's important because we have two lines on 42s. We'll have three lines on 40s. Yeah. We'll have, you know, 12 lines on 80s, all these different configurations. And what you're saying is if you had a mechanical type of device, yeah, you're limited you have to reset you have all that resetting and, or you just have one machine dedicated for, you know, leafy greens and one machine dedicated for right. romaine here, right. here, you're going to be, um, uh, able to see. And that that's, that's pretty amazing. So that's right. There's also a desire to plant more densely than in some scenarios growers just can't because if they're allow for the cultivator. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Interesting. So you're going to get better utilization of sunlight in essentially yeah. the alternate field. Oh, sunlight, water, nutrients, everything, and just general acreage. We're taking a short break to share that the Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by the team at Ag Solutions Network. Rooted in innovation, ASN is committed to leaving the land better than we found it, not simply maintaining it. We're here to help you navigate the balancing act of productivity and building a legacy. From practices to products, ASN is more than a new jug. It's a new way of thinking. So don't be afraid to be different. Be afraid to be the same. Contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. And now back to our show. So you talked about uh, one of the keys is, is um, uh, hit the weed super early. Uh, so yeah. one, of, one of the advantages there is when, uh, when a, any plant is early on, it's easier to kill because it's not yeah. making enough photosynthetic, act- yeah. doesn't have enough photosynthetic activity to survive. It's relying right. on seed stores. So you essentially um, can, can kill it uh, early and not have yeah. to overcome a large root mass. Yeah, that's right. We can kill it before people can even see the weeds. Like if you get down really close on your hands and knees that's and you stare at it, you can fault. see. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We we like to give our uh, we like to give our our growers an unfair advantage against. There you the go. Weeds. Yeah, but even even if you're down your hands and knees before you see it, your optics can pick that up yep. and target it and get rid of it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So these are these are um, it's it's a it's a really finely tuned computer vision system built from some of the best in the industry uh, in computer vision, and um, you know they're excited to be working on something that is actually doing some good for the world, good for the earth, yeah. uh, allowing growers to be more profitable and consistent. And, and a couple things comes to mind there too in a cultivation scenario. If you take a little weed and you happen to you know, hit it with a cultivator, you actually yeah. will reseed it because yeah, that's right. It'll, and it'll survive where you need a, a little more established weed to kill with a cultivator where this is, yep. this requires a lot of different thinking, doesn't it? It does indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these weeds are, are incredibly pernicious, like a, like a purslane, otherwise known as vertilaga. If you, if you tear that up and just leave it in the ground somewhere, it'll reroot and start growing again. All you did um, is make it mad. Yeah, that that's that's right. Yeah, that's right. You can turn the soil up and make it look nice, but um, inside that soil, you, you just spun up a bunch of seeds now. So because we're actually evaporating these things, they die. Um, it's generally a process called lysis, where we're we're exploding the cells of the plant with energy. Um, and when that happens, the cell walls have been ruptured, and it's not a it's not a living plant anymore. It's just dying, and that's what. Uh, that's one of the big advantages that we actually kill them dead instead of just move them around. So it's similar to a, um, uh, in a chemical application, that'd be like a gramoxone. That's going to be a sure. cell wall bursting or, or yeah. flaming yeah. or, or, or those kind of, or activities that's going to burst the cell wall, but mm-hmm. you don't have all those negative side effects associated with chemical toxicity or, that's right. you know, off target flaming where, you know, a lot of organic now growers today flame a whole field. Sure. And hope that their uh, cash crop is far enough ahead that it will survive and the weeds sure. will die. So. Yeah, that's right. So uh, relative to chemicals, yeah, there's no drift. There's no herbicide drift. We're very, very targeted. Um, you know, there's no residue from a system like ours. It is very much like flaming. Um, flaming, you can do with a series of propane torches. People typically do that as a pre-burn down. So they'll just sort of kill everything in the field before they plant. Right. Um, and so you could think of our system as a very finely tuned or, or sort of a micro version of flaming mm-hmm. that we can do after your crops have emerged because we have such tight control over what we're hitting. 
So I, a few things I was thinking about is the vision optics sometimes are interfered with by dust. And then just, yeah. and I'm like, well, wait a minute, we're not disturbing any soil. So right. that's less of a problem for you also. Sure. That's right. And we have a, we've, a, we've adapted the way that our camera system sits. There's a couple of different kinds of cameras, but mm -hmm. um, the, the targeting cameras that the laser sees are sealed up inside of a, inside of a cavity. So there's no dust that even gets up in, inside of there. Um, it, it, this has been, you know, several years of, of trials and production work and, and running through different fields and, and, and just sort of trying stuff. And we've gotten to the point that the, the system um, is incredibly effective and the, you know, all these issues around dust and cameras and things like that we've been able to work through. So the autonomy portion of the unit, is that um, based off GPS, RTK types of things, or is it based on rose sense of a, a furrow or, or yeah, the, vision optics of, of rows? The autonomy uh, in the robots is done entirely visually. So there's no GPS required to see the rows and stay in the rows. It's entirely vision driven. And the, the GPS is just there as a field boundary marker. So the robot knows where to stay inside. Um, the thing that we're announcing uh, this year is the um, a three row um, implement version, which is which is different. It's uh, higher performance. It's much wider, um, and it fits a little easier into some into the way that a lot of the farming practices are today. So we're we're really focusing on the laser targeting system, and autonomy is something that we're going to be. Um, spending more time on in the future, but what we're focusing on right now is the performance of the laser weeding uh, systems generally. I think that's a great strategy too, because mm -hmm. if you look at, you know, the the big green gorilla in the room, uh, John Deere, they uh, uh, essentially their autonomous announcement was an autonomous array on an existing tractor, sure, high horsepower tractor with a cab. Right. And, yep. you know, it was, it was pretty risque when, when CNH uh, announced a, uh, a you know, autonomous platform five years ago and it didn't have a cab. So, I mean, there's yeah. an adjustment period of time that farmers need, I think. So yeah, having this technology on a tractor yeah. it is a great bridge step and it lets you get a product to market sooner. That's going to help yeah. people faster than waiting for the, uh, the autonomy portion of the platform or, or, you know, it's going to be probably a swarm of them required to yeah. do it. Yeah. Great. Idea. Yeah. I mean, the thing, the, the truth of the matter is that a lot of farmers are quite innovative and they like to help bring technology onto farms to do things more effectively. Part of the issue is that um, there's OSHA issues around safety, around autonomy. There's um, issues just generally knowing what's going on in the field that isn't autonomous. So, you know, for example, in a lot of the fields up here in Washington, we have these big uh, center pivot irrigation systems. And if those don't plug into the system that your autonomous robot is using, then it doesn't know where the center pivot is. And by the, and these things are so large that, you know, by the time you see the center pivot, it's too late to get out of the field. So until a lot of this stuff starts to really be plugged in together, so that everything knows where everything else is. Um, we're, we have some, we have some things to work through in autonomy. Um, so we, we definitely have products in the future that are working towards that direction, but it's going to be, it's going to be a little while until we can actually get there. If you see in the fields today, everything that says it's autonomous, it still has a person either driving it inside of it or standing next to it with an iPad or what have you. Mm -hmm. It's not really autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly doesn't get the benefits of, the, of autonomy. So from our perspective, it's about performance, speed, um, you know, how fast can we go? So we, in this new product, it's uh, three times as wide. We've also increased the laser density on the machine. So the robots were eight, eight lasers um, on an 80 inch bed, for example. Um, this one is uh, 30 lasers. Um, on a 240 inch machine. So it's basically t 10 lasers for every 80 now. So we've increased the density by another 20% of the actual lasers themselves. Well, uh, congratulations to your team and Thanks. the decision to do this. I, I think that, yeah. that's excellent. And that's, that's a really big announcement now. Um, you know, we're, we're recording this right now and ahead of the announcement. So we'll, we'll sure. keep quiet, but <laughs> the announcement mm -hmm. will be made yeah. prior to the publish of this podcast. Sure. 
you hear it, you heard it here second instead of first. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a, a great, a great opportunity to, to really focus in on your core competency mm. and, and that's yeah. you know, laser technology. Yeah. So, yeah. It's been, and it's been really, I mean, it's been great. I mean, working with these farmers, we've been able to demonstrate a reduction in their weeding bills by as much as 80%. Um, there's been a number of other ancillary benefits that we didn't even understand originally. So one, one of the things that we discovered is that in a lot of leafy greens, if you're cultivating too much, you're cultivating for weed control purposes, you'll spin up a bunch of the microbacteria that's in the soil that's there to fix nitrogen and nutrients. And not only does that damage the ecosystem in which your plants are trying to grow, but if that stuff gets on the leaves of your produce, it will damage it. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the secondary benefits that we didn't really even understand when we started building this project. So I feel like we've gotten far enough along now that we started to see some of the knock-on effects of, of stuff that wasn't immediately obvious even to us in the beginning. And that kind of stuff, I mean, it just makes me feel really good to see that we're adding benefits in ways that we didn't even anticipate, you know? Something I think, and you've, you've mentioned it several times, Paul, um, you, you, you have a, a vision for what you want to do and, and, and see how new technologies could be applied to farming, mm -hmm. but it's been really, really key to you to talk to growers. Oh yeah. To and get out in the fields with, early and often. So, and talk to our growers right now, uh, that are listening in. How can they help be a part of helping ag technology companies? I mean, sometimes when you first approach a grower, are they a little standoffish or, or yeah. how, how do you, how do you get growers engaged better? And how could you encourage other growers to engage with, you know, your, your company, but other companies that are in this space? You know, it, that's kind of interesting. I had thought that perhaps these growers would be standoffish and maybe a little suspicious of technology, et cetera. Um, and I did not find that to be the case, um, certainly not more than any other segment. Um, the growers were in, incredibly welcome, welcoming and letting us uh, bring machines out to their fields and try different things. I think, I think, honestly, a lot of the problem is not on the grower side. It's more on the tech side. It's that um, all of this technology investment in places like Silicon Valley and New York and, and Seattle, we have a pretty robust Mm -hmm. venture capital ecosystem up here but the the worlds are between you know tech and farming um are too far apart right now there, a lot of the money that's in traditional venture capital is not going into ag tech and uh, you know we're trying to change that we're working to, to try to change that and th there are other companies that are also focusing on ag tech now and so i think i really view this as more an emerging tech market than um a situation where, you know, the, for, for example, uh, the grower is being standoffish or something like that. I actually don't think that's the case. I think there just hasn't been a lot of movement in this area, you know, partially because the location where the venture capitalists are is usually far away from farmland. So I hope folks like ourselves and some of the others out there in the world can help sort of change that. And, and uh, people will start looking at ag tech as an emerging place an emerging and exciting place to start doing a lot more investment. Do you feel like the farmers that you work with or other farmers in that space, which typically many farmers are well capitalized to, yeah. to be able to do what they're doing, sure. are they, are they interested in, in investing on maybe, you know, not on the, the series A series B type thing, but more on the angel side or the seed rounds. Do you find sure. that to be the case? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them do have their own programs that they've been trying a lot of different stuff. Um, you're right that they, that they are well capitalized. They have um, folks who know how to build things, you know, either on their local site or, or near them. And um, really, um, so the only thing that's kind of missing from that is there is some of the computer science and computer vision expertise mm -hmm. that uh, traditionally has only lived in, you know, the Silicon Valleys of the world, but I think that's getting closer and closer together. Um, but yes, the far, a lot of the farms do have their own innovation programs and they are trying a lot of different stuff. Um, but again, I think it's really the computer science portion of that that's kind of missing. So I hope we can help bring that together. I think the other thing for the venture capitalist is not everything's going to be an Uber. 
Okay. <laughs> not yeah. everything's going to well, be a software program with 98% margin and not everything's going to be the next, you know, Airbnb or, or uh, asset sharing platform, you know, sure. There has to be yeah. some diversity in those investments and just by its nature, ag is cyclical, right? So we get, sure. you know, globally, you get a Northern hemisphere or Southern hemisphere harvest, you know, once a year, not, yeah. not subscriptions every month growing. So sure. it, it's, there is a little bit of mentality change, but I think there's a lot of emerging impact funds and other where, you know, investors uh, realize that, hey, this may not be our unicorn, right? But we're investing not only for a return, but for the potential for impact when yeah, they look sure. at their overall fund performance. Do, do you see more and more of that emerging? Um, I think that there will be some egg tech unicorns. And once oh, sure. this starts happening, then... Um, people will become more interested in it. I'm sorry, um, I didn't say that correctly. I mean, carbon yeah. robotics is going to be an ag tech unicorn. And then yeah. what, once that happens, we'll get the interest. But be, be, <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I think, you know, there are many other markets that look like ag tech from the perspective of a VC, for example. So you could, you could make the claim that self-driving cars was very much this way. Mm -hmm. Um, it was capital intensive, a lot of unsolved problems, um, looked at as kind of a science project, you know, something that um, sounded good, but, you know, seemed sort of impossible. And it wasn't until some of the existing companies, Uber and Google, et cetera, started spending billions of dollars into these programs that the VCs looked at it and decided they were interested as well. And now there's, you know, I can't even count how many self-driving car companies there are. So, you know, it doesn't take, it doesn't take a lot, for, uh, it doesn't take a lot of success for everybody else to decide they want to get on that bandwagon. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly I expect us to be, to continue to be a leader in that, uh, setting the example for how Silicon Valley and farming can work together. And I do think there will be some unicorns out of this. Um, we certainly don't try to tell the venture capital community that um, they're only invested in this for, um, you know, the good of the planet or what have you. It's a, that's part of the pitch certainly, but you know, they also expect to make some returns on this investment. And truthfully, from where I sit, it seems completely doable. Like these things are not incompatible. It just takes enough um, tackling the problem seriously building things that are going to be farm tough, working with growers, getting machines out into the field. If you do that enough, you're going to be successful. I think that's a, a great, great approach to that. So to look at right now, a lot of your work is done from what I'm hearing and, and from what I've read in, in the produce type, especially crop sure. organics, the highest value areas. Yeah. So now once we uh, looking to the future, how do uh, applications for organic uh, commodity crops uh, yeah. or, or other more broad acre adoption, mm -hmm. um, where, where, what's the next steps in, in that direction, do you think? Yeah, you know, the only thing that we need to do to be able to get to the more, you know, generic row crops that are not organic, you know, a lot higher acreage, um, because they are... Uh, we need to build bigger and faster machines to be able to do what they're trying to do just because of the raw acres that needs to be covered. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, this is an example of us focusing on an area where we're very helpful today mm -hmm. and taking those learnings and be able to, to expand our universe and what we can do over time. But to get there, it's going to be, you know, bigger machines and faster. And that's what, that's what we'll continue to invest in with, uh, the money we make from selling our existing machines. So in a produce environment, we're normally dealing with a very clean uh, soil surface because of food safety requirements and mm. those kind of things. When we move to more commodity crops, mm. we're going to have a lot more residue on the surface. Sure. Uh, I've been following, um, you know, some of the things that the former Blue River team now at Deer are doing and mm. precision planning team at Agco are doing. Mm. One of the things they've mentioned is some of their vision technology has troubles in regards to residue and plant recognition in order to, you know, essentially they're doing sea and spray. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's a weed, hit it with a chemical, you know, um, where, do, where do you see what, 
how is your product going to be able to on on the distinguish in a high residue environment? Is yeah, we can. Burning? As long as we can see what we're trying to shoot, we can we can hit it. Um, it is harder in a more dense environment where there's other stuff in there, you know, residue, as you mentioned. Um, and um, a lot of that is just better computer vision. So the, the general theme of these neural nets, uh, deep learning driven vision systems, like what we use, is that if, it, if a human can detect it, then the computer should be able to. And uh, we're very far along in that technology. We do have some of the best deep learning people in the country working on this. Um, and so, you know, I think even the Blue River guys would admit that with the right kind of uh, deep learning neural net vision system, this would work. It's really just sort of getting there. Um, those are some of the challenges because you need enough, um, you need enough expertise to be able to build the right kind of system. You need enough imagery that's labeled to be able to teach the system. And you need, you need enough compute power on the machine to be able to run a neural net to do that. Um, a lot of our work on the hardware side has been, how do you build the kind of computer system with the kind of hardware in it that you need to do this deep learning vision um, and be able to run it on a machine that's gonna run in the farm in wide varies in temperature temperature for 24 hours a day. And that's been a lot of our uh, mechanical engineering and electrical engineering over the last several years is making sure that that stuff is solid. Um, but those are some of the challenges because the hardware that it takes to run that stuff is built to run in a data center where you have nice clean cooling and yeah. humidity controls. And so one, one of the things we've had to do is essentially build what kind of is a mobile data center inside the robots and tackling that problem seriously from the beginning, I think is one of the reasons we've gotten to where we have, um, because we didn't try to take short shortcuts there. We just sort of dove right into the problem about how do you actually do this? Um, some of these machines that people put in the field, they've tried to take shortcuts. And what I mean by that is, you know, using smaller computers or embedded systems only that had that weren't running, um, you know, fully functional GPUs um, and sort of saying, well, we will be able to optimize this network or, or we will maybe tackle the hard problems around how to run these things in the future, but we'll start in something small for now. And, and we didn't do that. We focused on actually trying to build the high performance version of this thing from the beginning so that we get, didn't get stuck in these areas. So, um, it's definitely possible. I think everybody knows it's possible. It's really a question about getting the right computer vision architecture and being able to deploy it in the field. I think we've done that, but we have a ways to go before we're um, in those uh, commodity row crops that you mentioned, um, mostly because of performance reasons, just how fast we can go. Yeah. And that, that's interesting when you really look at the, the three essential components, you have to identify it, you have to have the, the computer processing power on board. Yeah. And then probably, you know, to me, being the farmer, it's just uh, that satisfaction of shooting a weed with a laser is just beyond, you know, yeah. awesome. That's probably one of the easier parts of the, of the componentry that you've, that you're working mm -hmm. with. Is that, I mean, nothing's easy. Well, uh, no, you're right. Yeah, it is. Um, it's a good point. I, you know, I, 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 I would be hard pressed to say that that part is actually easier though, because um, none of this stuff is infinitely fast. There is a delay through every part of the system. So the camera takes a picture, feeds it to the vision system. Time has gone by. The vision system looks at that picture and figures out where the weeds are and then asks the servos to move there. Mm. Time has gone by. The servos actually get to the point where that we should be in the image, but time has passed. So the delay between every one of these steps means where the weed was when we saw it is not where it is now. And we've had to do a lot of work to with sensors and prediction around movement to figure out where that weed would actually be at the time that we're ready to turn the laser on. And so to human, this looks instantaneous, but... Um, all of those delays, milliseconds here, milliseconds there add up. And so that's, that's been a very uh, 
I won't say difficult, but it's been a lot of effort on the engineering side to also make the targeting as accurate while we're moving along, bumping around um, at varying speeds, you know, things like that, just because of we hit rocks in the furrows or whatever. Mm -hmm. So both of those parts, I think, have been equally interesting as a as a as a as an algorithm, you know, computer and mechanical um, challenge. And I, I don't know that I would really say that the vision part was harder. They've both been equally interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating to, to think about all that that's going on there. Um, yeah, yeah. It's computers run at such a speed that you, you don't really realize all the stuff that's happening, you know? Right, right. What are the power requirements for, for this kind of thing? And maybe that's, I mean, it's, is, it, is it a massive amount of power or it's, it's uh, minimal power it, it's no it's a it's a lot of energy i mean the, the to get the lasers to the energy state where they actually can fire it takes a it takes a bit of power um <clears throat> it's uh that's why we have um you know a generator on the machine the the engine is basically there to turn the generator to make electrical power that's mostly what's going on right on the robots some of that energy is diverted to hydraulic power to move but but still most of it's going to just making electrical power so it does require a fair bit of energy um and um the computers by comparison look relatively you know small <laughs> um but some of the things that some of the other things that have to be taken care of there because the it's not just powering up the lasers it's also keeping them cool and so there is a there's a um, a chiller loop running that needs to keep the liquid that runs through the laser out the outer jacket of the lasers needs to keep that cool. Um, well, for example, we talked about this keeping the computer environment where all of those GPUs live and the um, computer vision system is running, keeping it at the right temperature. And so there's also some AC that needs to be running. So there's a bunch of stuff in there that is ancillary that you may not think of that just a lot of it has to do with environmentals. So there's, there is a fair bit of energy that needs to be produced. So on your tractor mounted unit, will it still have its own generator for a consistent supply <laughs> source or will you run a PTO generator essentially? Um, we have an option to either front mounted PTO or a front mounted generator. Um, we did it that way because investigations into the, into a rear mounted PTO, which is sort of the standard option. Um, doesn't really work that well when you're lifting the implement and have the power requirements that we do. So that was, um, we ran a lot of experiments there and the systems for power generation off the rear mounted PTO, just because of the lifting required to make these turns and stuff like that. Um, it's not very, it, it doesn't give us what we need. So we have a front mounted PTO option, which a, lo which a lot of people are doing. Uh, or a front mounted generator. And we do that just for weight and balance. Right, right. Very, very interesting. So when you get into, you know, uh, how big that you're talking about targeting the small weeds, you know, mm -hmm. if you get into really heavy weed pressure and mm -hmm. or bigger weeds, is that uh, today an area where it's just that's not what it's designed for or you look yeah that's right yeah there's there's certainly a place where you don't want to use us because it will just take too long to kill the to kill the weeds so if you if you have um advanced weeds where they're um really taking root and they're starting to grow you know starting to grow fast they've got i don't know what three or four more than four tree leaves, let's say on a weed, that's probably the point at which you don't want to use this. It just, it just take too long. Um, and so that's kind of, that's why we like to get in there early because we can kill them fast. Mm -hmm. um, and if you wait too late, if you wait too long, it's just going to, a laser solution like this would just take too long to kill the weeds. And that's going to take a little farmer training too, to get in there quick because we really haven't done that before. So the timing of the irrigations and. and those yeah, that's right. That's right. Very, yeah. And sooner than what a weed crew would be essentially. That's right. We're in there. We'd like to be in there earlier than a weed crew. We have, we've done a bunch of examples of sending us through um, on one part of a field and sending a, a hand weeding crew on another part. And then if you let that, run for a month and see what happens you'll find that the the carbon robotics side remains a lot cleaner mm -hmm. because we're killing stuff that a person can't see can't get to mm -hmm. so your hand crew goes out there they're pulling stuff but they can only see so much and 
a lot of these weeds, when they first sprout up, you know, they camouflage against the soil. A lot of them come up and they're, they're either so small or some of these things in their early stages, um, the, uh, the early flag leaves of some of these weeds are the same color as the soil. And so, you know, you, you can't really expect a hand crew to be able to get in there and do that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but our laser weeder goes through there and just kills it all. So um, we do have better efficacy and uh, both immediately and long-term because of that, because we can kill all this small stuff really early. Um, and, uh, but if, you, if it's just too late in the season and the weeds are, you know, tree sized, then uh, yeah, it'll take too long with the laser. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's an excellent tool though, because you can get it killed sooner. You're not going to get the, um, we've talked before in the past on the podcast, uh, Dr. Chuck Swanson out of the university of Guelph did a lot of research years ago about far infrared, near infrared light ratio. And the yeah. fact that weed presence changes how a vegetative plant grows. Right. So if you can keep that extra green, you'll, you'll change how that plant grows. So it's, it's better for its life. Uh, yeah. Lots of advantages. Yeah. Just it's, uh, the farmer just needs to know where to use this tool. So we're not going to go sure. out at my farm in five foot tall rye to use yeah. it as the burn down pass. So, yeah. but yeah, sure. we could certainly take care of that. And then sub subsequent passes could keep, yeah. it, sure. keep it in check. So sure. Yeah. That's the, that's a good way to think about yeah. it. So the go to market strategy yeah. for you, how, you know, how does, how does this look? Uh, how is a farmer going to, to get this uh, and say, uh, they've listened to this right now. They want to, want to pick up the, uh, the phone or, or fill out a form on carbon robotics website mm -hmm. and use this. What does that look like? Are you going to be supporting farmers directly? You're going to be working with uh, you know, uh, key, key innovators or, or, mm -hmm. how, or key, key technology suppliers. Mm -hmm. How are you going to, make this all happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So we are selling direct, supporting direct um, for, that's what we have been doing. And that's what we're um, set up to do. We are starting to um, at least talk with folks about partnering around some of the support and supply of these machines. Um, maybe by the time people hear this podcast, some of those some of those deals might be in place, but we are starting to think about that. Trusted partners in region who farmers like that we can trust and they can trust. Um, and uh, that is a program that we're going to be setting up this year. But from a, from a farmer perspective, um, we like to think that we take responsible, responsibility for everything that happens from you know, our factory to their field. And so even if we are going through uh, some partner somewhere, it'll still be a lot of carbon robotics people making sure that things are going well and and you want it to you know be able to learn from them too and feedback and improve your product and yeah so we need to yeah that's that's yeah definitely that's essential because we still have a lot to learn from the farmers and we still have a lot to learn from what happens in growing seasons i'm sure we haven't seen everything yet mm -hmm. and uh, we need to remain on the ground understanding what's happening so paint a picture for us. What's next? Okay. So we, we've talked a lot in detail how this thing works and those kind of things, but I'm sure there's, there's some mind blowing ideas of, of where these kind of things could go. Um, mm -hmm. you know, just in general without, you know, giving away the, the future mm -hmm. strategy, but wh where do you, where do you see this plugging into a farming system and what the potential is for the future? Well, we've talked about a little bit. So, so autonomy on the farm is the thing that we'd, we'd love to help with over time. Um, and a lot of that is just enabling all of the other things that are happening, be part of a system where you can see what's happening. Um, the uh, other portion of this is all of the places where a computer vision system like ours can help on the farm is not just limited to weed control. And so we've been running a lot of different experiments with other, other projects. So Computer vision plus robotics, I think, still has a lot to offer in, in other areas. And part of the reason why this hasn't happened until now is because the, the vision technologies are still relatively new. Um, this stuff is still under active development. There's a lot of research going on. The ability for computers to see objects and actually identify what's happening in the real world based on just cameras is still relatively new. And as we talked about, the VC investment in this space has been, I think, relatively low and it is, get, you know, is, is getting more attention now. But so I think we're at the point now where computer vision can achieve certain things it wasn't able to before. And the traditional venture capitalist 
folks are looking at this space. And so we can bring vision plus robotics to a lot of other places in the farm. Um, and that's what we're looking to do. That is pretty awesome. So what you're saying is we're, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. Just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. I mean, anywhere that people are out doing work, that's, um, hard and difficult and dangerous, you know, we should be able to have robots help us with. Now for a, a fun question to kind of, kind of wrap it up here and unless, unless you got some other things you want to throw out there, but, uh, I just have to ask, I am an yeah. Austin powers movie fan. Okay. Uh -huh. So yeah. was, was the scene of, uh, sharks with laser beams on their heads, any part of the fun <laughs> develop, does that come up in discussions at any part of the, out of the company culture? <laughs> It certainly comes up a lot um, in, <laughs> yeah, uh, in, you know, in memes, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, it was not a thing we were thinking about at the time because most of it was just how do we kill these things without, how do we kill these weeds effectively without just sticking more knives into the soil? But as a side effect, there has been a lot of Austin Powers references. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Those meetings went a little bit too long and, and, and people were getting a little delirious and they said, yeah. why not, uh, yeah. you know, Dr. Evil type plans, yeah. right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, anything else I should have uh, asked you here today, Paul, while we were together, uh, with our time or any other thoughts for, for the future in a regenerative ag space? Um, you know, I think, uh, I think we covered most of it. I am very excited to see what's happening in, in regenerative egg just generally. And I think over time, we're going to learn more benefits than we even know about today based on regenerative practices. Well, I'm very excited because our mission is to make regenerative agriculture, the conventional agriculture yeah. and with vision technologies and, and automation that you're working with, you're right at the intersection of those tools and that we will be needing in order to make that possible to where we can get to reduced inputs. We can get to uh, better decisions, better quality crops, um, and, and just do a better job for the, the soil, the plant, the animals, and ultimately us and the earth. So I, yeah, uh, I'm excited about what you're doing and your team's doing. So keep up the great work there. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the interest in our company. Very good. And uh, we'll have uh, show notes uh, with uh, links to uh, Carbon Robotics and the work that they're doing there. I encourage everybody to check that out and uh, keep cheering them on and, and be a willing participant in, in what they're doing. So thanks right. again, and we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, great. Thanks, Monty. How awesome is that? I hope that got your gears turning as you learned about this new technology. Imagine the opportunities as Carbon Robotics continues to learn and develop solutions that can help us improve our practices. And as always, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help growers implement soil health practices, check out our website at asn.farm. And there, you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening. <laughs>